you know, I think you have to really look at what that dog is doing, what their lifestyle is. Um, and this holds true for any size dog. If they're a, you know, a 30 kilo dog, but they really don't do much in their life, maybe surgery is not right for them. But if it's a 10 kilo dog and they're an agility dog and, you know, or a little papillon that's, in, you know, doing agility, they're still probably going to do better with surgery than with conservative rest. So I think it's more about the individual dog and not necessarily that, that size. Welcome to the Call the Vet Show, the podcast that helps pet parents understand and optimize the health of their furry family so they can live the full and happy life you want for them. And here's your host, veterinarian Dr. Alex Avery. Hello, 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 and welcome to another episode of the Call the Vet Show. I'm veterinarian Dr. Alex, your host here, and today I'm bringing you an interview with Dr. Kristen Shaw, who you just heard in that intro. Dr. Shaw is an orthopedic surgeon. She is an arthritis advocate and she brings a huge amount of experience in our discussion today all about cruciate ligament disease. And injury to the cruciate ligament has to be the most common orthopedic injury that our dogs experience. In fact, it's one of the big reasons why we've changed the general recommendation about the timing of neutering spaying, because if we're doing that too early, it actually can increase the risk of this injury happening. And as you'll hear, treatment can be complex and is not always straightforward. And in today's conversation, as well as discussing what this problem actually is and why it happens, we dive into the world of conservative management, whether non-surgical options are going to be appropriate for your dog with their lifestyle in your particular situation. We dive into all the different kinds of surgeries that can happen because there are numerous, which come with a lot of confusing acronyms. And then a huge part of successful treatment involves the rehabilitation, the management after surgery, if that's what you've gone down, to make sure that our dogs recover really well, but also to try and limit the amount of arthritis that affects them in later life. And so whether you've got a dog who's just ruptured their ACL and you're wondering what the best treatment option is, or you've got a breed of dog who is just more likely to develop this injury, this interview is for you. So let's jump in. Here's this episode's expert interview. Dr. Kristen Shaw, welcome to the show. I'm really delighted to be talking to you today. Thank you so much. It's wonderful to be here. So we're going to dive into the world of cruciate ligament injury and surgery and treatment and recovery. But before we get into that, I'd be interested to hear about what you know brought you into this world of orthopedics, of joint disease and of arthritis. Yeah. So, you know, as a a surgical resident, we get trained in both soft, what we call soft tissue surgery, which is general surgery and orthopedics. And I had a love for both. Um, You know, I, I I did research it on both sides, but somewhere in my, my surgical training and my residency, I developed a particular interest in rehab um, uh, physiotherapy. And that kind of went along with the, the orthopedic side. But I will say that I spent several years actually doing primarily general surgery and then kind of rehab on the side. What really drove me to my passion for arthritis management and then, you know, the rehab and orthopedics that go along with it is caring for my own dogs with arthritis. And I have probably learned more from them than I have from the hundreds or thousands of patients that I've taken care of. Yeah, yeah. It seems to be a common theme in people I speak to who are passionate about arthritis is it's that light bulb moment came when their own pet suffered from this really debilitating problem. And yeah, we'll dive into the the impact that arthritis can have no doubt later on. But talking about cruciate ligament disease, um, I guess we think of that as an ACL injury with, with people. What exactly does that entail? Is it just one problem or is there a spectrum of, of issues that we're dealing with? Yeah, that's a, that's a great way to, to frame it. It is It really is kind of a spectrum. So just to go back to the basics, and, and I usually do refer to it as ACL um, when I'm talking to, to pet owners as well. So ACL in humans stands for anterior cruciate ligament. You may hear veterinarians say cranial cruciate ligament. It's the same thing. And to break it down, a ligament connects two bones together. And in this case, it's connecting the femur or the thigh bone to the shin bone or the tibia. And the job of a ligament is to prevent motion. It's allowing a joint to move in just the right ways, but not any more than that. 
So in humans, when we tear our ACLs, it's generally the result of some sort of trauma. So a skiing accident, some sort of, you know, usually some sort of acute injury that we, we tear that ACL. In dogs, it's quite different. Um, it's, we consider it to be a spectrum of a degenerative process that the ligament is kind of inherently or predisposed to starting to weaken and fray. So if you think of that ligament, that ligament like a braided rope, there's thousands of little fibers in there and they can start to fray early on. And when that happens, what we generally see is some, you know, you'll see our dogs limp. um, But as veterinarians, we don't necessarily appreciate any instability or, or any extra motion in the knee. But over time, that ligament continues to weaken and continues to fray. And eventually it will completely rupture. And then we can have the development of arthritis and we can have tearing of other structures in the joint, such as the meniscus. And the problem is that because it's this gradual process and there is a predisposition of certain individuals that one goes, there's a reasonable chance that the other knee is also going to be affected. Exactly. Statistically, we say 50%, but, you know, I feel like it's more than that. (laughs) I feel like more than 50% of the dogs that I see come back to see me for the other side, but that's a, a general reference. Yeah, and it may be that the other one isn't quite so bad and frayed and maybe isn't appreciated as being a problem when actually there is, you know, there is one there. So it's a pretty, yeah, it's a pretty common injury that, you know, I see in general practice and is seen across the world. But there's quite a lot of confusion, I think, among um, so among vets as well as, as which the best treatment option is so we've got our conservative management we've got our surgery there's all kinds of different surgery which will have all kinds of acronyms so it can pretty it can get pretty confusing especially as the costs can be fairly significant so yeah what what are our general treatment options for this disease yeah um you know i'll there there are the spectrum of options like you mentioned conservative management which can include physiotherapy rest pain management um braces, and then their surgery. And I'll just share with you kind of my experience and somewhat evolution in my approach to cruciate disease. Because when I, when I finished my surgical residency and I was gung ho about physiotherapy and rehab, I was like, I'm going to put orthopedic surgeons out of business. We're just going to rehab these guys, especially the early ones, the ones that didn't have a lot of instability in that knee. And so I spent many, many years treating patients with physiotherapy, um, a couple of them with braces, and we'll come back to braces in a second. And ultimately, we never knew when to kind of say, you're good to go back and run around at the dog park. Um, We never had that that check mark, um, even though it felt like it. And the couple of success cases that we had um, ultimately went on to tear their ligament years later. And at the same time, as my confidence grew as a surgeon, and I realized that, hey, I can do a surgery pretty well, and this dog's back to running around at the dog park, you know, three or four months later, and the degree of arthritis is usually less if we intervene with surgery earlier. My approach has been surgery first, um, that I consider cruciate disease a surgical condition, unless there's a really strong reason not to do it. Yeah, yeah. I completely agree that from, you know, I know when we've been through an evolution, I think, you know, we used to just put a lateral suture in and, you know, that was the only option and that was something that I was comfortable doing. And now we've moved to these osteotomies, which I'm not performing, but I've seen a huge, a huge improvement in recovery as well as I think end result. Um, yeah. And yeah, absolutely. I consider the result far superior to, to our rest. I guess we think of, you know, like, like traditionally um, the statistics I was, you know, I can't remember what they were exactly, but it was dogs less than 15 kilos or something, you know, they did reasonably well with rest, but yeah, I'm not sure that's necessarily the case. You know, I think you have to really look at what that dog is doing, what their lifestyle is. Um, And this holds true for any size dog. If they're a, you know, a 30 kilo dog, but they really don't do much in their life, maybe surgery is not right for them. But if it's a 10 kilo dog and they're an agility dog and, you know, or a little papillon that's, you know, doing agility, they're still probably going to do better with surgery than with conservative rest. So I think it's more about the individual dog and not necessarily that, that size. Yeah. And for those people, and we'll jump into the surgical options in a bit, but for those people who just really can't afford surgery because there is that financial barrier, what would the ideal 
kind of conservative management does it involve braces is it physiotherapy if you can get that hydrotherapy what what what's the ideal there i think it's really important and i always talk about this with my surgical clients that um surgery is elective right this is not a life saving surgery and so it's important to understand what if you don't do surgery and there was a really nice paper that came out that showed 60% of dogs not having surgery um, had a reasonable recovery. Those 60% of dogs, or you know, what the recommendation is, is first and foremost, pain management, um, because it is considered to be a, a painful condition, uh, especially once arthritis sets in. Um, and then second, equally important is weight loss or weight management. So dogs that are overweight um, are more likely to tear their cruciate in the first place. And having them lose weight can help them in that recovery process. But then after you've done those two things, physiotherapy can be helpful for sure, but it's really about a waiting game. It's waiting for that body to just kind of scar down the knee and stabilize it on its own, just like a dog would do if they lived on the streets and never got to see a veterinarian. Yeah. Yeah. And so surgery. So we've got, I've said, we've got our lateral suture, which is probably not being performed very much. Maybe in smaller dogs, it's still something that's done more, yeah, more often. But we've got lots of different um, kind of osteotomy procedures. So where the bones being cut and the, the angles within the joint are being modified. But there's a number of different techniques there. So yeah, is there a better one? Is there something that's you know definitely worth the top dollar, or you know, is it is it too much of a compromise to be going for a lesser surgery? So, you know, I think when we look at the two different types of surgery, the lateral suture type, which is the aim is to try and replicate what that ligament's doing in the first place. But the reality is when we put that lateral suture in, we don't expect it to last forever. Um, it's, it's going to weaken, it's going to tear. So what we're trying to do is actually just speed up the body's natural scarring down process versus when you do an osteotomy, and osteotomy means to cut the bone. So you can cut the bone in, you know, a whole lot of different ways, but once you cut that bone and you reposition it and the goal of repositioning it is to change the forces and the biomechanics that work on that joint so that you don't even need that ACL in the first place. The beauty of working with bone is that once that bone heals, it's as strong as it was before you cut it. So once that healing occurs, you don't ever have to worry about that weakening. So to answer your question, is there a best osteotomy? What most surgeons will say is the best osteotomy is the one that that individual surgeon is most comfortable with. Um, so in, in my hands, it's certainly a TPLO. Um, I was trained with TTAs also, but at this point in my career, I, you know, I'm going to say TPLO is the best one, but there's other, you know, other very reasonable options. Yeah. So, I mean, so in our clinic, um, the fact that I work with, he's doing a TTA and um, yeah, I guess it's potentially less technically demanding although there are more and more jigs i think available that make the surgery um you know the different techniques um you know a little bit easier in general practice and certainly like i say we've had some fantastic results with that and it's really um you know comparing night and day between our lateral suture especially for these bigger dogs they're you know they're weight bearing really nicely the next day almost sometimes without lameness which is just yeah. incredible <laughs> I had, um, when I was a surgical resident, I had a dog that had an amputated back leg and we had to do a, a surgery on the, you know, the one, one knee it had. Uh, and actually I wound up doing a TTA for that dog and she got up the next day and was walking really, really well. So yeah, wow. I mean, the, the surgical procedures do, do work well. Yeah. The pressure would have been on for that surgery. You don't want yeah. to. <laughs> Fantastic. Not a lot of repair, yeah. Yeah, and I guess it's a bit like a lot of um, maybe other surgeries we do. I'm thinking um, dentistry where, um, you know, we're taking out, we're, we're effectively removing the pain rather than causing it. And, you know, and dogs are eating as soon as they wake up when they've had 20 extractions. Whereas if you take that pain away in their knee, mm -hmm. it's, um yeah, it's it's really significant. So surgery isn't the end of things, though. I'd like to say with any orthopedic surgery, especially almost that the recovery period is 50% of the job. So what should that look like? Because they can't, although they're walking really well, that can maybe trick us into letting them do more than they should be. Exactly. So that's exactly it. The trick is to not let them do too much while the body is healing, especially if we've cut the bone and that bone needs eight to 12 weeks to heal back together. And the dog's they are going to feel like they want to run around and jump and play and do all the normal things, you know, two or three weeks after surgery, if they do too much too soon, 
all sorts of bad things can happen, um, ultimately leading to more surgery, um, potentially infection. So what the recovery should look like is progressively increasing the, the walks, the, the controlled leash walks. Um, adding physiotherapy in, whether it's underwater treadmill or swimming or other modalities, that can certainly be helpful. Um, and there's some research to, to support it. And, and really what physiotherapy is doing is um, speeding up that initial recovery. Two years later, we can't tell a difference between dogs that had physiotherapy and dogs that didn't. But for pet owners, I find that it's really helpful to help guide them through that recovery process if they have someone that's really helping them more than the surgeon would be. Yeah, it's maintaining that muscle mass, I guess, and that kind of confinement because, you know, just like us, you become a, they become a little bit of a couch potato and, and potentially, like you say, we've got these bigger dogs that are often overweight in the first place. So, you know, we should be hopefully losing weight as well. Whereas, yeah, if you're stuck in a crate or a small room and not doing very much, then yeah, the weight can climb. When I first started doing surgery, when I was a surgical resident, when we would finish an orthopedic surgery, we would say, put your dog in a crate for two months. Yeah. Take them outside on leash to go to the bathroom back inside and that's it. And thankfully we've, you know, we're not doing that at all. We know we need to build up that muscle just in a controlled manner. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And then should we be starting on supplements or changing anything else with a view for long term? Because I think we touched on at the very beginning a joint injury, it does predispose to arthritis. And I think depending on the age of the dog, arthritis is pretty much a given in yeah. that joint. Um, what can we be doing to maximize joint health for as long as possible? Yeah. So dogs that have an ACL injury, hundred percent of the time will develop some degree of arthritis. So being proactive, you know, we can keep harping on it, but weight management is the most important thing. Um, omega-3 fatty acids. So fish oil, that's my favorite supplement or kind of my, my first line of supplements that I'm going to use. Yeah then I know there's a lot of, um, difference between supplements in, in different countries. Um, the one, the next one that I reach for is actually, uh, an injectable type of supplement. It's a polysulfated glycosaminoglycan called Adequan. I think yeah. you guys have Cartrophin. Cartrophin. And I think Cartrophin. we've, yeah, that's the one that we use. So, yeah. 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 So that would be the, my next line of, of, um, supplement okay and are you are you sorry are you tending to give that just because i'm interested we uh, are you tending to give that in the the kind of the weekly course and then every month or as needed or is it kind of just that monthly injection for life or how do you find that that works best yeah i tend to do so for for adequan the regimen is twice a week for four weeks and then usually a once a month okay continuation there yeah 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 no that's cool because i have to say like i think i used that quite a lot at the early parts of my career and we've kind of gone away from that i think we do tend to give it to our cruciate patients at the time and kind of going on thereafter but not necessarily carrying on so yeah no that's just interesting yeah and then all the other oral supplements i think right now the the one's getting a lot of play and i'm curious to hear what um your thoughts on is greenlit muscle um yeah. Yeah. knowing that I, from your neck of the woods <laughs> yeah i mean i think that yeah like that's um yeah that's huge huge industry here in new zealand um yeah. yeah i mean i wonder how much of it is just an omega-3 fatty acid source I and mean, it's what we've got the best um the best evidence of efficacy for um and whether there are a few other nice to haves i think yeah, yeah the problem with the supplement industry and and it almost seems like every week we get a new rep come in and say look we've got this it's got this proprietary chemical in it that is amazing and is wonderful and you go well okay well great where's the studies and they go well here's one from this one person or this one person's done two papers and and i have to say i'm a little bit skeptical in the sense that we know that the omega-3 and the fish oil sources works or it helps so you know i'm because they're not they're not cheap either a lot of these things yeah i i couldn't agree more um and i i would say when i when i give lectures anywhere or talk to veterinarians or pet owners, the number one question I get is what supplement do you recommend? And it, it is tough because I think if we as veterinarians don't make a recommendation for a supplement, most pet owners are going to go look for one that they, they saw an ad for on, on the internet. So I do like to have something to recommend, but it is also having a discussion that is, is it really financially worth it? Yeah. So, I mean, we recommend, so we've got um, Sinovan EFA, which is a krill oil, I believe. Um, and I think there's some greenlit muscle in there as well. And the JD and the yeah. joint diet, which has got that that all mixed in. One thing, um, I guess, to touch on, we have a lot of um, flaxseed oil supplements as well. And that's something a lot of owners reach for because it is cost effective. But in dogs, it's not 
particularly efficacious, is it? Correct. It's uh, the dogs don't metabolize or process the flaxseed the the way that humans do. Uh, I mean, I take flaxseed oil. My dogs take fish oil, um, and it really is worth investing a little bit more in the fish oil because it's going to actually do its job. Yeah, it's actually going to work. <laughs> yeah, which is yeah. a big a big thing. <laughs> Right. And so into the future, these guys, do they need, so they need monitoring, I guess, for that other joint. Are there any telltale signs that their their other cruciate is a problem? Because I guess some of the difficulty is, is that if they've got a bit of a sore knee in the one that we know is a problem, then they're not necessarily going to manifest in the same way of carrying their leg um, as they did at the very beginning. Right, right. So some of the early signs um would be, and, and pet owners may have noticed this for the first side, is the dogs don't sit squarely. They kind of sit off to the side. Now, usually if they're recovering from a surgery on one knee, they're still not going to sit squarely. But it, kind of monitoring that willingness to fully put that knee through normal range of motion. And one thing that a veterinarian can do is, is feel that knee and see if, if it is willing to go into full extension or fully straighten it. If they're not comfortable in that full extension or fully straightened knee, that's an early indication that 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 ligament is starting to fray and it's starting to to be abnormal. Um, Otherwise, it would just, and I would see this pretty frequently, is as dogs would be recovering from their first surgery, all of a sudden the clients notice that the other leg is not as good and they're just off, you know, just kind of a little bit limpy on it. Yeah. And it's always very difficult then because when you've spent several thousand dollars on one surgery, and even if you know that there's the risk, you'd like to have a little bit of time to to save up the money for the next one, right? Yeah. Fantastic. Dr. Kristen Short, this has been a yeah, a fantastic run through. It's a it's a difficult time for pet owners because there's a lot of money involved and their dog is clearly suffering. So it's great to have that kind of clarity of, of thought. Um, I guess the bottom line is work with your vet and, um, you know, do what you can. But there are other options because I don't like to think that people feel guilted or feel really guilty if they can't, you know, surgery is out to their reach. There are definitely options there. I, I will say one point about um, braces because I I do get asked about it frequently and in, in my hands, in my experience, I don't recommend braces because if you're going to use them, they're, they're best to be custom made. And at least in the States, the custom made ones are going to run a couple thousand dollars and they will inevitably cause rub sores. And so then you're dealing with irritation to the skin. Um, I've been able to, to be just as successful without a brace and a non-surgical management than with a brace. So that's just my personal take on it. Yeah, I'd completely, completely agree. And the, yeah, the, the, the ones that you get for a hundred bucks or something are not worth yeah. their, you know, worth not, not, not worth a, the, the yeah. postage. Um, and if you're spending that kind of money on a decent brace, then why not spend it on surgery? Because also that brace is going to be molded to the one side and not the other side. So fantastic. So where can people find out more about you and the work that you do? Because you do a lot of fantastic work with arthritis and, and all kinds of different things. Where where can people dive into more details? So I, I started a website called caninearthritis.org. So it's caninearthritis.org. And I started this website to provide more information to pet owners that are struggling with, with how to care for their dogs with arthritis. Um, it's all free, all free content on there. There is a section that's specifically for veterinarians. And really the difference on the veterinary side is, is the, the description. So using medical language versus uh, lay terms. So I would direct people there um, can learn a little bit more about me. I've had a lot of amazing colleagues help contribute uh, articles to that site. Yeah, it's a fantastic resource, and you might we might be thinking, well, a cruciate ligament is not arthritis, but it will become arthritis. And if we can put in those early small changes, like the weight loss, almost every talk, I, every every conversation I have, we always end up at weight loss at some in some way. Um, but those small changes really make a huge difference to a dog who's had this this cruciate ligament disease. Yeah. And there's a lot on fish oil. At one point, I'm not sure if we still are, but we were the number one Google hit for dog fish oil supplements because there's wow. a lot of on there. Yeah, that's a, we that's don't, a, that's a we're Google not, you know, win. Not I know. selling it or anything, but there's some recommendations and some links to buy it, but we don't make any fish oil on our yeah. own, just education. Yeah, fantastic. Oh, thank you so much for your time today, Dr. Kristen Shaw. It's been a pleasure talking to you. It's been wonderful talking to you too. Thank you. Helping your pet live the happy, healthy life they deserve.
So we covered a huge amount of ground there. And to be honest, if your dog does currently have a cruciate ligament injury, it's probably worth your while listening again because Dr. Kristen Shaw kind of really left us with some fantastic nuggets of information that are so critical to a successful outcome, no matter which path of treatment you decide to go down. And another episode that I'd also recommend you jump into is episode 95 with Dr. Hannah Capon from Canine Arthritis Management, where we talk clearly a lot about arthritis, but we also dive much deeper into the world of supplements, which we kind of just really touched on here. Now, because this is such a common injury, I'd love it if you could share this with your friends and family who may be going through this exact conundrum of what best to do for their dog so they can be better informed and get them back up and running and living the life they deserve as soon as possible. So thank you in advance for sharing this. And all that's left for me to say is that I'm veterinarian Dr. Alex. This is the Call the Vet show. I'm looking forward to talking to you next time. But until then, take care. That's it for this episode of the Call the Vet show. Be sure to visit callthevet.org to join the conversation, access the show notes, and discover our fantastic bonus content. We'll see you next time.